I'm Susan Clinton, and I'm here with my co-host Carolyn Van Dicken and Joletta Belton, and we are the Genius Project. This is uh, Project Seven, Part C, and our guest expert is Dr. Bronnie Lennox Thompson, and our subject is "Do I Silence My Patients' Distress?" The parts A and B of the project have already been recorded, and you can find them on our website uh, that talk about the introduction of the, of the um, topic, and then we interviewed Bronnie um, a few weeks ago, and you can find both of those interviews um, up on our website. So tonight, we're going to open it up and let people ask questions and bring in their per various perspectives of this project. All right. Well, who would like to start? Anybody have a specific question that they want to ask of Bronnie? I do. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, Joe. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and it's one that comes up a lot, and I'm sure we talked about it before, but I thought it would be, be good in this format, too, to hear other perspectives as well, especially because we do have people with lived experience in the conversation as well as clinicians. But a lot of times, I, I feel like some of the pushback on listening to distress or hearing difficult stories is I'm not a psychologist. And um, so I'm just wondering, Bronnie, what you think about that, that framing of I'm not a psychologist. So that resistance perhaps to listening to difficult stories or listening to a patient's distress or trying to figure out what is distressing for that patient um, and how to go about kind of making that not so scary for people. Not that I'm showing my bias there at all. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like um, where do I start with this? Because it, I, I just, I'm not a psychologist. I'm an occupational therapist. I listen to people. It's, people cry. I cry. It's fine. Um, I find that it's really weird, actually, because when we look at where all of us work in health, we're going to encounter people who are in incredibly stressful situations, going through um, all sorts of turmoil, and to think that the only people who are allowed to say, I really care that you're going through this, are psychologists, beggars belief, actually. <laughs> and I, I just think that this is about being human, and being real, and authentic. And when we hear somebody who is going through a rough time, what would we want to have happen for us? I'd rather have somebody say, hey, that sounds terrible. How can I help you? Mm. Than have them say, sorry, sorry, not my problem. Go and see the psychologist. They'll help you. Because that just seems, I can, I can understand the concern. Um, I'm going to open up Pandora's box and it's going to be, going to take longer than I've got time for. What if I leave this person in a worse state than they were? What if I dig down and there's some dark secret that they didn't want to tell me and I've somehow tricked it out of them? Um, and I, I think that that's, those are concerns that are probably well overblown. I don't think that you can re-traumatise somebody by asking them, how are you feeling? Or that sounds really difficult. Or can you tell me a little bit more? I think it's much more traumatizing to be shut down and shoved in a corner and told go speak to somebody who knows what they're doing. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, I'll get off that soapbox. No, but so you know, oh, I love the soapbox. Yeah, and, and you know what? We need to just hear it over and over again as clinicians because yeah. I think fear yeah. on our part is is probably one of the biggest challenges, right? So, Bronnie, yeah. my question for you then at this point is how how do you think clinicians can become more comfortable in addressing patients' distress? Like what are the skills they need in order to do that? And how do they get those skills? Um, I think when, when I was a baby OT, one of the things that we learned to do was to sit on our hands when we were watching somebody do something. And I think in a sense, what we need to do as clinicians is learn to zip the lip. And then I think we need to have a box of tissues handy, mm. prominent, because mm. you don't want to be fishing around looking for it when you need it. Mm -hmm. You probably won't need it all the time. Um, and then learning how to reflect. So this is what I've heard. 
and then be real, being authentic. To me, that's about um, so taking away some of the things that we've been told. Like, there's a lot of concern that if we reveal something of ourselves, that we are somehow stepping into, um, I don't know, indulging in our own fantasies of how wonderful we are. But actually, when we say something like, that sounds really tough, we're just being a human. I keep coming back to this is being a, about being a human. So I think it's learning how to reflect. This is what I've heard, or checking out. Can I just check that I've heard what you were telling me? And then paraphrase. So that we're we're actually being honest about sometimes I'm not listening, sometimes I'm a bit busy, sometimes my head's going nuts and I can't quite make it out. So um, is it okay if I check out that that what I've been hearing is this? And that's, um, I think we get taught a lot in our training to always be right and to have the answers. And when we're stepping in to listen to somebody's distress, we may not even have an answer. And that can be the scary thing. But I guess I'd like to put this out to people living with pain. Do you want to have someone have the answers? Or do you want to have someone says, hey, I'm, I'm here with you. I'll be with you. It's almost that journey metaphor of I'm, I'm along yeah. on your journey with you. Um, yeah. and I can, I can you know, walk beside you on that journey, but it's still your journey, right? Yeah. 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 I, I love that sense of like just humanity and humility. And, and I think that can be really helpful for people to, to recognize, for clinicians in particular to recognize that you can hear difficult things and not have to fix them. Yeah. You know, that it's not, it's not your onus, not your responsibility to fix the hard things. It's, it's to sit with and be with and acknowledge the, the distress without having to have a solution for it. Um, and I think that can lift some of that weight as well. And something you said, Bronnie, when you said, what if I leave the person in a worst state? And that's, I think that comes up a lot too. And it's, it's as though people think that those of us in pain, like aren't thinking about this all the time. You know, like, like <laughs> yeah. these are things that we're living with all the time. It, yeah. it, we're just yeah. not given an opportunity to give voice to it a lot of times. We're not given permission to share those hard things, or we're not given permission to share the things that come with pain. We're often directed just to talk about the symptoms, just to talk about like functional limitations, rather than talk about how pain is affecting every aspect of our lives. And perhaps some of the things that we have lost that we've never been given permission to grieve for. Um, like all of those things, it's, it's not that it's re-traumatizing for those things to come up because they're always there under the surface. Yeah. It's just that there's never a place for us to be able to share those things with someone who can receive it and, and be okay with that receiving of it. It's a bit like when you've got a child and um, so a pet dies, we can't just rush in and i'll get you another puppy it's like actually we have to with children say that was really really sad you really loved that puppy dog and i think that's almost what we want to learn how to do is to be okay with that so coming alongside i keep using that term bearing witness just to be there so that somebody else knows that you know that you're there but you're because otherwise I think we can become um, people with pain can become invisible and mm. marginalized and made made invisible because we don't talk about this stuff. Oh, we'll talk about sleep, but we won't talk about the nightmares. We'll talk about the fact you can't get off to sleep, but we won't talk about what's going through your mind, which is that I'm worried about what my future is going to be. Um, and that is not about being a psychologist. That's just, listening and making visible something that's already there and is common sense I can, I can remember back in the early days the the first question everyone always asked was 
what level is your pain today? <laughs> Whereas that wasn't the issue. If someone had just mm. said, how is, how's the pain affecting your life? What is it you'd like to be able to do? What yeah. can we work on? And that did happen to me eventually. How can we work on something that you can do? And we started out very gradually. I found two people, a physiotherapist and a psychologist. And um, yeah, that is exactly how I moved forward in the end by people asking those questions and not worrying about where my pain level was. Mm -hmm. The pain was there. It was always going to be there. Um, I could deal with the levels. I just wanted to be able to do something else besides worry about the levels. <laughs> I love that framing, Mary. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, that I find that's really important, though, because when it's when so much of the focus is on, well, what's your pain level? But that's not the, that's not the totality of me. It's yeah. how's my family? How are your kids? How's this affecting your relationship with your husband? And again, I, it's not that I'm expecting a physiotherapist to be asking necessarily all those questions, but even in the generalized sense of how's home life? Mm. Because there's emotional pain, there's mm -hmm. psychological pain, there's other than, you know, what you think is, oh, gee, my, you know, my elbow is hurting or whichever. Um, I think a piece for me, and I think part of this is going to take a little bit of a preempt, if that's so, Carolyn, in terms of mm -hmm. explaining how I came to, to this. And that's that I was in a car accident. Uh, it's 30 years ago now uh, when I was pregnant with our third child. And I ended up with a head injury um, and a seizure in the eighth month. And it was a big deal with the delivery. They didn't know if the baby would be um, brain damaged or if I'd be paralyzed uh, from the delivery and so forth. Anyways, um, I had had the, the car accident left me, though, with chronic headaches. And in essence, the chronic headaches were kind of like the um, tipping point of opening Pandora's box for a number of things that had happened in my youth. So how would I have known 30 years ago? Obviously I'm telling you all of this in hindsight or with this hindsight. And, um, but that the, the chronic, the, the headaches in particular would then put me in a state of um, not being very good at dealing with other emotional things that I had just buried or, you know, not dealt with because, well, that's okay. I'll just keep moving or working or doing or what, whatever other yeah. uh, coping strategy I had. And, and 30 years ago, it wasn't like I'd ever heard the phrase PTSD, but I actually was living with PTSD symptoms, which actually only exasperated the pain symptoms of the of the immediate injury of the of the head injury and so so then over a number of years i'd worked with physio and chiro and massage and cranial sacral and uh, I, it's a whole long list of all these different modalities and every time i'd go i had this question it was um what's wrong with me mm -hmm. and i realized um without going into a lot of detail just about that when the day came when i said there's actually nothing wrong with me. I just haven't found the right combination. I recognize that it wasn't about who I was. It was about that there was some aspect that I just hadn't, I hadn't put all the pieces together yet. Mm -hmm. So that was a big shift in perspective on, on um, seeking, seeking help and so forth. Then I happened to be at the gym one day and, oh, sorry, wait a minute. Along the way though, I ended up with, um, a uh, fair bit of pelvic dysfunction. I had um, uh, a prolapse. Um, and so someone at the gym in the class, another woman I knew said, oh, have you not seen a pelvic physiotherapist? Which I didn't know that that specialty existed. I'd been to a lot of physios, but, and then she happened to recommend that I see Carolyn. So it was in the process of seeing Carolyn that I, unraveled more pieces to the chronic pain scenario. But to also bring this back to what you're just saying about, well, um, how does it feel? Like, how do you want to be treated by a therapist or so forth? At this point, because I had already been working with a psychotherapist, I had become familiar with being able to walk into her, um, into her space 
and take a moment to check out the environment to see if anything had been moved around or if there was a window open or something that I started to recognize were my triggers of whether I felt safe mm -hmm. and, and trusting. And I remember one of the first sessions with Carolyn was that she actually explained to me and she said, you know, have a look around, you know, do you, do you feel okay in the space? Um, that the door was closed. I remember asking, could the door be locked or unlocked? And she said, whichever I preferred. Mm -hmm. But those are all, I'm not going to use words like tiny or big because that's just like trying to define it, but they're all pieces to how uh, safety and trust can already be set up before there's even a whole lot of conversation about what's what the problem is. So um, my, my issue at the time was a lot of um, pain with intercourse. And as a piece of the backstory that was significant in this is that I had spent time in the hospital as a teenager. Um, and I had, unfortunately, I'll say received, I'm not sure what words to use, um, a number of internal examinations by someone who had come into the room repeatedly but none of the internal examinations had ever been recorded. So, so they, and when I ended up going, I was sent to the uh, gynecology department and it happened to be a woman that I saw and she was a gynecologist and she asked me what was going on. And I it was the first time that I actually cried and she said, what's wrong? And I, and I said, well, how many more internal examinations are you going to do? And then she asked, well, what do you mean? And I explained what had happened and how many times. And, um, and, and she did nothing. She didn't respond. She, she just put her hand on the desk and she walked and she, she actually stood up and she said, I'll be right back. And she came back and she said, um, I won't be doing another internal examination. And within a week I was discharged and it was nothing was ever explained. I was only 18 at the time, and but my dad had died a year before. My mother had had a, a, a nervous breakdown, and I was like, I'm out of here because I just, I knew I wasn't going to be able to deal with one more overload, in ter especially now that I realized that I'd been sexually, repeatedly sexually violated in a hospital. So then I arrive in Carolyn's office, and I'm thinking, okay, so now I have this pain, but I have meshing because I'd had surgery that meshing, my bladder is, um, bladder's uh, sitting in the mesh and the vagina is held up underneath. And, and I'm like, wow, it really hurts to have intercourse. So over, Carolyn, I think we worked together for over a period of about three years. Um, but the one significant day that I want to share that, ha that, goes directly with this conversation. I had already shared with Carolyn about what had happened in the hospital and so forth. And so she was doing internal examination. She was working on the clock, you know, the 12, 3, 6, 9. And interestingly, when she first started with that, uh, I had no sensation of where 12 or 3 or 6 or 9 were. And then in this particular time when she was doing palpation and I remember I, I reached down with my one arm with my hand and I put my hand on her wrist and I said, don't, don't move your fingers. You're touching the memories. So in all of my, my own studies on trauma and how that's held in the body, I recognized for me, it was an experience that here was this compassionate person, Carolyn, who was, you know, has her fingers inside of me, but she's literally touching the memory. And, and I can still sense how the tension where her fingers were just started to dissolve. But in the moment that I put my hand on her arm, she never flinched. She held my gaze. She never looked away. 
but there was also a look of compassion on her face. So that to me, those are the skills. Can they be learned? Well, I think they can to a degree. I think a lot of that has to do with that, you know, a physiotherapist can become informed of those aspects and then, and then literally learn or, you know, attempt to incorporate them into their practice. I also think that it has to do with some maturity as well as maybe that a person or a physio has done their own personal work so that they're not afraid of looking at things that can sound, you know, pretty hard to hear or however. I'm not saying you have to fake it or anything, mm. but if Carolyn in that moment, if she had have responded by looking away or not being able to hold my gaze, I think it would have deepened the shame that I already was feeling. Mm. Instead of being met with this, this warmth and compassion, and yet she didn't say anything. She didn't have to because she held my gaze and she didn't move her fingers. And in that, in that moment, the tension dissipated and I went on to have, I, I have no pain with intercourse. I still don't have any pain with intercourse, but it also helped to release a lot of the other things that I knew I was holding that had to do with an overall chronic pain um, that I was carrying. And, and yeah, I know there's other pieces to my story, but still having witnessed my mother's mental illness and my father dying and, and then the hospital scenario, which I never could tell my mother about because I figured it would send her into another breakdown. The, the car accident head injury was really just, uh, um, yeah, knocked to the head to say, it's time to look at your life and, and sort some of the emotional uh, baggage out and then be able to release those held tensions and traumas, which I think played a huge piece in the persistent pain that I was carrying. So when I happened to see that this was posted, that this was your conversation for this evening, there truly is no separation between the psychosocial, emotional of any person and, and um, how you don't need to be a psychotherapist to see a client but it is about, I think there are skills that can be learned or at least recognized that can be imperative, that can be incorporated into a clinical setting. So I know you're on the call, Carolyn, it's why I'm here, but it's, it's with a gratitude <laughs> that's, that's eternal. Lucy, your, your bravery and your vulnerability in this moment are truly remarkable. Well, thank you. You are a remarkable woman and you have worked incredibly hard at finding your peace, right? And so I, I commend you on that. Thank you. And I, and I have found it. I have, I've gone on to study uh, uh, yoga tune-up or tune-up fitness. I teach a class now at a gym that's using uh, therapy balls to relieve muscle tensions and to aid in uh, mobility and yeah, ease of movement and living into more vitality. And, and I live pain free. I mean, I get, you know, your aches and pains, but all of the chronic headaches that I had for at least 20 years, solid 24 seven are gone. And the same with joint pains. I've had knee surgeries, elbow surgeries, the abdominal surgery, I, I don't have any of that pain anymore. So I know it's possible. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Mm -hmm. Brownie, do you have any comments or kind of, I guess, I guess just in follow up to that for just a moment is, you know, is empathy learned Brownie or is empathy a skill we inherently have? Because I think connection is about being able to sit with someone in pain, right? And, and that's empathy versus sympathy, right? Yeah, to me, um, I think we can cultivate empathy and then we can also, alongside that, cultivate willingness to be present. Mm. And that's what, Lucy, what I was hearing, that, that 
It was about being fully present to just be there and hold that moment as precious. And to me, that's not jumping away in what your head wants to, you know, your mind wants to tell you. It's just preserving that moment as such as such a, a precious gem. That and to do that, we need to learn how to be present to what is, and not to be anticipating what we're going to say, what we next going to do, or remembering, or thinking about what we're going to have for dinner. Or we actually need to be there. And I noticed that in the very best times, and and it sort of came to me as you were telling your story. It's as if time is suspended and we're just there mm. and it's just held and it's just the most, it's a wonderful time and it's about being ready to, willing to do that. Mm. It's a wonderful connection. Yeah. yeah. Lucy, thank you so much for sharing your story and I think that you sharing your story embodied embodied the whole theme of this project mm -hmm. so really appreciate you coming on and sharing that um and and something that's really striking me between what you've said and carolyn said and Bronnie has just said like lucy you had mentioned cl the clinician themselves being able to do their own work mm -hmm. and being being able to even sit with you in that moment and to hold your gaze and do those things that that some work had to have been done on Carolyn's part in order for that to be able to happen. And that, that being able to cultivate empathy in the being with, and it makes me think about just our systems in general. And do we cultivate environments for the clinicians to be able to do that work, to be able to, to be compassionate, not just for their patients, but for themselves as well, and be able to sit and reflect and have that space to be able to do so. And how much different might care be for people in pain if we did more to take care of the clinicians as well? We, we have that um, clinical supervision model for occupational therapists and psychologists. So we're sitting with and processing and having a safe place to be vulnerable as a clinician with somebody else who's not going to demean you, but to honour that is something that I think the vision practice gives us, that reflective practice to think about who am I being? What are my, what are my values in this moment? What's important? And it takes the, to be able to have that time outside of clinical time to say, as a clinician, I want to be this kind of clinician. Um, and I think we, not all professions do supervision, and I think it's a shame because to say, what kind of person do you want to be as a clinician is one of the growth areas for being a really good clinician, I think. If you realise that this is work that we need to do as health professionals across the board. It's, it's interesting. It's interesting that you say that, Bronnie, because I've been talking about this for a long time and making that sort of connection around how if we're going to work in this biopsychosocial framework, we need, I think, as physios to have some supervision as well and supervised practice. And I finally put my money where my mouth was and I have hired my own uh, supervisor that I meet with now on a monthly basis. We just had our second meeting and I think it's a really important component um, for clinicians who are going to hold space with patients um, in pain. And if you treat pain, you, you need to um, broaden that perspective. I don't care if it's MSK pain, ankle pain, shoulder pain, fibromyalgia, headaches, uh, pelvic pain. Pain means we have to take a step back and broaden our perspective and, and do some of those deeper things that I think OTs have done much better than we have as physios. That's our, our foundation model, but I think it's that, um, it's reflective practice, mm. saying how, how have I been in this process? What, what, you know, what, what did I do well? What didn't I do well? What would I do differently? That whole over every single time we see we're working with somebody, I think it's something that keeps us curious. It mm. keeps work fresh. But most of all, it helps us think more deeply about what we're doing. Yeah. Who are we being? 
and gives us a lot more tolerance to it's not tolerance it's actually more willingness to be a learner and that's what I see myself being in, a, in an interaction with somebody I want to be a learner to learn from them about their experience because that's precious it's a gift yeah. that we give them and I like I like all of that because I first of all what Carolyn was saying is that she's allowed herself to become more vulnerable by opening herself up to say, I need somebody to work with me yeah. on the place, you know, so I can be a much more reflective or, or I want somebody to work with me in my reflections. However, you have set that up for yourself. Um, the idea of the, uh, you know, compassionate care comes out of self-compassion. And I think in the physiotherapy world that I live in, it's trial by fire. Mm -hmm. and not um these these are things that are not rewarded and burnout is high mm -hmm. and people are not happy and they're not healthy and how can you hold space for somebody when you know when you're not in a, a good place either and i think and i think it speaks to vulnerability and i being able to find the right people to give you the support just as a client needs to find the right support I think we all need to find the right support in many ways so that we can be present when we when we're there and um, as present as possible we're all human but I, I would find one of the questions I have for you Bronnie is given all of that and that background and things like that and um, knowing that about 80% of the thoughts that a human brain has are negative how <laughs> like do you have any words of advice for the clinicians because I think one of the things that holds people back, or at least what I've heard, the perception I'm getting from when I talk to other clinicians is um, more of the, I would rather do it the other way because at least I know what I'm doing. It's like the self-doubt, I'm not good enough. I don't know if I can, what am I, I'd like those kinds of symptoms you were talking about. What if I can't help them? You know, what if that, yeah. but just being able to kind of, you know, from your perspective, really being able to be gentle with those negative thoughts, not silence them, they're real. We're not gonna silence them. But how, you know, kind of, can you give some, you know, advice out there for people that are listening that, that kind of really struggle with that or feel that, you know, profoundly? I mean, our minds are really good problem solving devices. They jump in and they come up with all these answers and all these questions mm -hmm. and all these um, thoughts that, no, you, you're not good enough. That's, and I live with that as a, you know, I think female academics in particular have, have that issue. But uh, for me, the biggest thing that's helped is, is using mindfulness, actually. When I'm sitting there in, with somebody um, and I find my mind wanting to go bananas thinking about what I ought to be doing, just stopping and breathing and noticing contact of my body on the chair and my feet on the ground and just observing and listening is it's that practice that's got me to be much more okay even when somebody's really angry which I find to be the hardest mm -hmm. that's the that's the place when I, I find it most difficult when somebody's really angry about something that's happened mm -hmm. um it, just to be able to sit there and be be there and reflect you've been in a really awful situation that that's that I think that's the skill of being in the moment not ahead of yourself and not behind and even then when you're doing the reflective practice being aware that for I start with what did I do well <laughs> so when I do my reflective practice I always start with that sandwich idea of what do I do what did I do well what would I do differently um, what didn't I do so well? You know, where could I have polished up and what will I do differently next time? Um, and I introduce that to the patients that I work with, um, facilitators who are taking group programs. Everybody needs to do this because that's the way that we ponder and we think about what we're doing. Otherwise, we just become little automatons and I don't want, I don't want that. And I don't want to be treated by one. And, I don't want to be treated by an algorithm. Mm. I want a person, thanks. Mm. Yeah. 
Nicole, do you have any questions to wrap up? We're going to have, oh, have one more question. Is there anything that's top of your head at this moment? No pressure. No, I, you know, it's, it's kind of, I did at the beginning, but then through the conversations, it's all sort of indirectly being answered. And I just want to comment uh, on just Bronnie's last comment. I find, I think that that's where perhaps I struggle a little bit the most. I, I feel like I'm, I'm able to sit back a little bit more and take in when I have a client who is sad or upset that they have so much pain. But I think when that real anger, the anger, mm -hmm. and when they're really angry, that's when I, I, I want to jump in and, and, and de-escalate and calm them down and give them. And, and, and that's when I, instead of just, well, why does that make you so, instead of just being that reflective or like, I see that makes you, like I'm, I'm, I'm okay with the, I can see that makes you frustrated. Or I can see that's very upsetting for you. Upsetting, I think, is different than anger. But that real mm -hmm. angry, that's when I, that's where I have the challenge with me as a clinician wanting to, to jump in and, and really take them down as opposed to just letting them go through that and experience it. And, and that it's not my job necessarily to, to change that. Um, I think what I've learned is that um, we can't hold on to an emotion for very long. Mm. Like it gets to a peak and then it's going to drop. Yeah. And for lots of people, their anger is because someone else has not done something. And often they've cut them off or they've mm. been dismissive and they haven't given space. And, and or they've you know, minimized in some way the impact. So to me, just uh, and I'm still learning to do this because my my little you know rabbit brain says <laughs> freak out so a breath and and that's an interesting thing stopping and having a breath before I make a comment mm -hmm. um one of uh it was a mediator that I was working with with a work situation with somebody who would get very angry so you just lean forward and have your pen in your hand and just draw draw something mm. and then look it's just that um giving yourself a moment to hold on before you want to fix it um and that that just buy yourself a minute's time if you're just writing down a couple of words of what the person said just seems to for me it's like a soft self-soothing so, you know oh, i've got my pen in my hand my life must be fine because i've got my pen <laughs> it's all good <laughs> and um and then and that leaning forward invites me because my response normally would be run run away just leaning forward it's it's like an, um i, I want to come towards you i want to be there with you and it's counterintuitive and yet it actually helps it seems to de-escalate by itself so, but I'm excitable, so maybe that's <laughs> no, I love that though, Bronnie, and I think it's it's so valuable in so many areas of life, not even just patient encounters in the clinic, but just in in the political times that we're in. I think it's really yeah. valuable advice for all of us, and it just reminds me. And and Mary will be familiar with this too. Like, there's a great fear around pain patient advocacy that it's always going to be angry patients coming in yeah. wanting to direct things. And I always used to be really resistant to that and fight back against that. That patients aren't always angry. It made it made myself realize that we don't take enough time to say mm -hmm. these patients. There are patients who are angry. Let us yeah. stop and reflect on why they're angry. Because a lot of times it is righteous. Mm -hmm. And we, if we keep mm -hmm. resisting it and trying to not listen to them, we're just making the problem worse. Mm -hmm. and, and so we need to, to lean in mm -hmm. and, and take out that breath and just listen and to learn from that. And that will probably de-escalate those tensions on the other side as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah we've got and remember it. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Mary. I was just going to say, we get this sometimes in the groups, um, but um, it's, it's very good for them to be able to speak to other people 
who are peers and who understand exactly where they're coming from. And that I find it de-escalates. Um, they're usually new people or they, there's one person I can think of who's been struggling to get um, an operation for quite a while. And um, he, he can sort of vent that knowing that everyone else understands and it, it's really good for him to be able to do that. So, yeah. Finding a safe way mm. to express mm. anger. And when I look at some of the ways that people are treated and the systems that mm. people have to battle, um, the the suspicion and the suggestion that you're malingering and that, you know, the struggle to actually be heard, I can understand that anger. I get angry when I've gone through things, you know, the suggestion that fibromyalgia is not a diagnosis. Mm. Really? Um, um, that still. really irks me. And, and, and yet I'm articulate and I've got, you know, I, I know my space. But lots of people who are going through this the very first time, they've never been in this. So no wonder, you know, people get angry. Mm -hmm. It's a confusing, messy, nasty area to, to be, to, to have to navigate. Mm -hmm. And so the... the I'd like to add to that. Go, yeah. I'd like to add to that that it's like to, to have pain and then to be angry. I experienced it that it was about that I felt that people didn't believe me. So it isn't just the hearing of the pain that I hear you, that you have pain. It's, and I believe you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. As a clinician, believe when they're set, they're telling you they have pain, whether there is any reason for the pain or not. Obviously, if they're feeling pain, they say they're feeling pain. That is the the patient, the client's reality. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so yeah, honestly, just even hearing the words "I believe you," that's why empathy actually comes from when you can put yourself in their shoes. If you've experienced it yourself and you have a direct experience of it, it becomes about and I believe you. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's it's one thing I say a lot too to to clinicians that it might seem awkward to actually explicitly say I believe you but it can be so powerful for mm -hmm. a person in pain to hear that who has been dismissed and doubted for mm -hmm. so long like to actually explicitly hear that someone believes you and that that's embodied in their mm -hmm. reactions to you and their conversation with you yeah. Um, that can be so immensely powerful mm -hmm. and just lift such a burden you didn't even know you were carrying. Until well, that develops trust, though. Mm. Because yeah. if you want to talk about a patient, you know, therapist trusting relationship, even if a therapist I saw can't comprehend what I'm going through, as long as they believe that what I'm saying to them is my truth, Mm. And then I already feel a comfort knowing, oh my gosh, they believe me. Mm. So, yeah. I don't know where that um, suspicion comes from. For me, this is the reality that we are there as clinicians to believe what people tell us. We're not truth. We're not lie detectors, and we never have been, and we shouldn't be. We shouldn't even attempt it. That's not our job. You know, our job is to be the person that that people can trust and will respect their space. On that note, Bronnie, <laughs> we are going to say thank you so much for joining us for these last two sessions and for sharing your thoughts and your wisdom in this really important space. I want to thank Lucy <laughs> and Mary and Nicole for joining us on this live discussion, for each bringing your unique perspective and I think for just the vulnerability that we all shared as clinicians and patients um, tonight, I think it's really powerful. And I hope that this will help other clinicians and maybe patients to also find that space, maybe find that caring provider that will listen to their distress and as clinicians to really become that provider that is okay and comfortable with listening to a patient's distress and, and to hold space for it. So Bronnie, we cannot thank you enough. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from New Zealand. And uh, our next project um, is yet to be determined. And if anyone has any thoughts, we are more than happy to listen. I have a few thoughts just, and we'll, I'm sure we all do. And uh, we'll see what the next one comes up as. So we'll see you in the new year for that. And in the meantime, good night, everybody. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Brian.